welcome to today's episode of Positively Geared. I'm Alex Augustiniak, co-host, joined by Lloyd Edge, host of our podcast. Welcome, Lloyd. Hi, Alex. Good to be with you again. It's great to be back in the studio, Lloyd. Uh, we haven't had as much time in here as we would have liked to during some of the lockdowns and working around that, but we're really excited to be back. And uh, we have a very special guest with us today who we'd love to give a warm welcome to. Janine Alice, you don't particularly require any further introduction, but we are very grateful to have you here and talk about some of your life experiences and what the future holds, but also learning a lot of the learnings you've had over the years throughout your journey to today. Great. Thanks for having me. So where do we get started? Well, we've got so much to talk about. One of the the key points that we really wanted to cover with you today, Janine, is obviously several months ago here in New South Wales, Sydney, where we're recording this podcast, we have gone back into lockdown like many parts of Australia. And, you know, there's been a lot of challenges that have come to that in business, but also mental health, which is something Lloyd and I are very passionate about and we do discuss and have discussed in previous podcasts. What we would love to get your take on and pick your brain on is, you know, inspiring people during lockdown. What in your mind and experience is some of the things that you can do coming into lockdown that people can basically pick up, whether it's learn a new hobby, improve their skills on something. How do you approach lockdown and what opportunities does that bring for you? Look, it's so individual, you know, so you've got to remember, let's take it back, you know, to even into the 40s. Like back then there was, you know, people going through war and, and hardship you know, this is the very first time that we have discovered any sort of hardship in ever, right, in our generation or the next last two generations. So we are at a point where we haven't actually had the resilience to be able to cope with what we're dealing with now. But I think it's keeping perspective. You know, every single day you actually have to turn around and go, what am I going to achieve today? Right? I actually just spoke to a friend on the way here and she broke her ankle. She goes, Janine, I'm really stressed out. I said, well, you know that that's not even real. That's, it's actually a, a, um, an illusion. It's something you create yourself. And I think when you stop and think that the stress that I'm feeling, even though it is a real stress and, and actually real stress causes real disease and real death, but stress actually is, is manifested in the, our thought process and how we think. So it's really important that we think about our health our exercise, and also how we think about things. Look, you know what? Even the most positive people on the planet go, okay, I'm going to think positively today. I'm going to go running. And then other days you just put your doona over your head and go, just don't want to even play today, right? And so that's normal. But I think it's nearly that fake it till you make it. You know, if you say, right, today I'm going to do X that I enjoy, then, you know, make sure you stick to it and know that how you're feeling, you can actually change. I mean, science has shown that you can change how you think. Just because you're born a certain way does not mean that is who you are or you've been raised a certain way. You can actually change how you think at all times. I mean, I think the books like um, A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle or some of those other books that are sort of around that, how you think, are really powerful to immerse yourself into just to enable you to stop and reflect and change. I love that you mentioned Eckhart Tolle's book. I've read that book many times and I, I had the audio book in my car for a period of time. It's a, it's a really fantastic book. Lloyd, we were discussing briefly before Janine met us in the studio here about some of your earlier experiences in business when you did make the decision to transfer from being a teacher to setting up as property professionals many years later. Interestingly, just tying this into lockdown and you know what is a, a breeding ground and has been a breeding ground for many new businesses that we have seen actually take off and capitalize on what we're going through at the moment. Early into your career, you know, you had a lot of people, Lloyd, sort of trying to steer you one way or the other, telling you you shouldn't do this, you shouldn't do that. Janine, we're really keen to get your input on this, you know, early into when you're establishing, you know, Boost and and some of your other business ventures. How did you both deal with, because it comes back to limiting beliefs and sometimes other people's limiting beliefs can try and steer you in one direction or the other. So Lloyd, you've had a lot of people when you started out sort of suggesting, oh, well, I don't know if that's a good idea. How did you deal with that? And then Janine, how would you go about dealing with that? Yeah, it's really interesting, Alex. What I found with a, a lot of people I used to work with is that they used to always say to me, you should stick with your secure job. And it was always a secure job, never leave that and things like that. And that's always an old adage and belief that we're sort of growing up to believe. And I think it's about really having that self-belief. But I really like what you said, Janine, about you can actually change because as I've developed um, through life, I've actually developed some beliefs that are a lot different to what the way I was brought up, which helps a lot. But I think you've got to surround yourself uh, with the right people. So I always think if, you know, if you're the smartest person in the room, then you're in the wrong room. So for me, it was about getting in amongst the right people and having some real belief and having those goals in place about what I really wanted to achieve and why I was doing it. And for me, it was about setting things up, you know, better for my family in the future, looking after the finances, 
and also creating uh, the sort of lifestyle that would also be able to benefit people in the future. And I've, we've spoken before that my wife and Renee used to, you know, she used to sort of say to me, oh, you'd be able to you know, meet clients in cafes and talk to them about how they can develop their property portfolios. And that to me was very inspiring. That's what really was the catalyst for me to, to make something happen from that perspective. And Janine, your experience? Look, I came from, and I was brought up in a place called Baronia. And for anyone listening in Victoria, they go, really, Baronia, right? It's, you know, it was a really tough area. You know, the school I went to, you know, you wouldn't mess with us because, you know, we would just beat the shit out of you, really. <laughs> and, um, you know, it had some awards. It had the highest pregnancy rate. So, you know, it was one of those real areas that, you know, gives you good resilience. So in actual fact, when I started my business or started going down a path, I didn't know what I didn't know because I didn't, no one told me it could be done or couldn't be done. I think naivety can play a huge part in success because if someone came to me right now and said, Janine, I'm going to start a business, a juice bar, and in four years I'm going to have a hundred stores, I'd go, whoa, Bessie, wait, you know, yeah, that's just, I'll tell you all the reasons why it won't work. I didn't have anyone tell me it wouldn't work and I didn't have anyone that put a glass ceiling on it. So I just went into it with this youthful enthusiasm to be able to just do it. And then once I was in it, it was like, whoa, okay, well, there's a problem here and a problem there. And I had three little kids at home at the same time and you just worked through every problem that you had and you learnt really quickly and you adjusted. But I think, uh, you know, interesting Lloyd's book called Positively Geared. I think I am actually genuinely positively geared. I'm always constantly going, what's the good thing out of that? You know, even that conversation I had with that girlfriend was, okay, you've broken your foot. What is a positive you can get out of that? Like, how can we turn this into a positive? So I think it's really gets down to sort of how you think. But equally, to Lloyd's point, who you surround yourself with? You know, there's people who will tell you you can't and there's people that will tell you you're not good enough. And you really need to think about who you're hanging out with in business and also in life, which makes a massive difference. And Janine, reflecting back on what we, we might call new business energy or, or naivety was a term that you mentioned, you know, obviously that was great in the sense that you could have a red hot go and you weren't necessarily worrying about, you know, 20 people in the background pulling you in 20 different directions. Was there a stage now or later in your career? Because, you know, something that we really love about all the guests we have on the podcast is and ourselves, you know, we love the vulnerability and getting inside every business mind because, you know, self-doubt is something that I think we all experience at stages of our career in life. Is that something that you've had challenges dealing with or past experience with more recently or earlier in the career? I think you always have self-doubt about different things. I mean, you're not human unless you have the gamut of emotions. I equally sometimes think I'm a superwoman. And other times I think like you know, if I'm a you know, very poor surfer, sometimes I go out and I go, oh my God, I can do it. And other days I go, oh shit, actually really I can't. <laughs> and equally with business, you know, sometimes I'll go into a meeting and I might say some really dumb stuff and I'll go, oh God, Janine, come on. Maybe I'm not that da da da. And other times you go in and go, actually, I'm, I'm in my space and I'm in my zone and I can do it. I actually think... Um, there's this guy called Paul Taylor who told me this story about how to manage that when I was going on Survivor. And he said that there's actually two people that's with you all the time or multiple people. We spoke about how, how we think about you know, all these people are in our head. I have two people. One's called Debbie Downer and she's the one that tells me, you know, don't go in the water, don't do yoga, you're not good enough, da 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 And then there's this other woman called Agora and she is a warrior, right? She can, there's nothing she can't do. And sometimes I deliberately focus on, like, particularly when I was in Survivor or I'm going into a big meeting, I'll go, Agora, can't I, need, I, need, I need a bit more of you today. Get rid of Debbie Downer. And I think that consciously if you sort of go, right, let's move into the, into the right space, immediately your shoulders go back. Immediately you're standing a bit taller. Immediately you're ready for war. You know? So I think that it's important to set yourself mentally up for any challenges that are coming. I think that's really good, Janine. Love to listen to that. I think the naivety thing is really important because, Alex, like when I started my business, I didn't know anything about business. Even when I left teaching and went into business, I knew nothing about structures and I just thought, yeah, I could just go and do this. And then I just learned on the way. And then obviously I started having to get, you know, lots of it. I, I knew about property, but then I had to get sort of advice on structures uh, from my accountants and solicitors regarding business and setting things up. But I think in the first place, I just, you know, fully backed myself because I thought, well, you know, what can go wrong? Because you don't know what you don't know. And then you get into it and you just think, okay, well, there's a lot of things I've got to learn here, but I'm already in deep water. So let's, let's run with it. Mm. It's very true. And, you know, we've touched on it in, in previous podcasts, that journey. And, you know, it's really interesting, Janine, to hear your take too. And it very much is a mental battle in many respects. I think, you know, trying to get the best out of yourself every day, there's going to be days where you do wake up and it's a bit like going for that run first thing in the morning. It's easy to do. It's easy not to do. And just training yourself to get a bit more mentally resilient can help in the longer run. Lloyd, I want to talk about the dream team, which, you know, you reference in your book, Positively Geared. Mm -hmm. Every single person, in essence, has a dream team. 
in a property centric sense, it's, you know, it's the solicitor, it's the broker, it's, you know, the building and pest reporter, it's having everyone in your gambit that you can refer to for a specific niche task when you're going through that process. Janine, in your career and from setting up Boost, when that business does start to get into, I guess, a massive state of flow and, you know, as you mentioned before, you're going from setting up one or two shops to being faced with 100, 200, constantly scaling. How important was a dream team to you? Is that a term that you've sort of implemented or you're familiar with in the sense of having the right people behind you? I don't, we don't use it as the term dream team, but you do need, we think, probably four or five lieutenants, really strong people around you that are completely different different in personality and really strong in their field of expertise. The key thing, though, that all of them have to have in common is the same sort of ethics or same sort of work ethics or the ability to be comfortable in their in their skin enough to appreciate the talents of others. So for example, you know, it's often an accountant, if they're very, very strong on the analytical side, don't appreciate the benefits of a creative. Equally, a creative doesn't understand the benefits of analytical, right, particularly if they're extremes. So you still need, even though you have this so-called dream team that of all these great people that are amazing, you still need them to have that self-awareness to know what they don't know. And I think that's probably where you get the greatest people is one to go, oh my God, I really appreciate you, Christian, for your creativity. I could never do that. So let's work together because I can certainly help you in the mechanics of how to make your idea the best it can be. So that's actually probably the best team you can get, not necessarily the best accountant or the best creative. So Janine, how did you go about finding the right people? Because you know what you're saying is, makes perfect sense, but finding the right people who can actually work together as part of the team can often be a big challenge for a lot of people, in, me included. So how did you find the right people? I think at the end of the day, you hire slow and fire fast. You never always get, I mean, I sometimes get a great team and go, oh my God, I'm awesome at it. And then other times I go, oh my God, I'm just really shit at this. I just can't find the right people. And some people through um, interviews do a really good job and they sort of hoodwink you, right? I find though that there's two types of people out there and they're the ones that I call the verbs and the ones that I believe that choose to soar. And I'll explain what those two mean. Basically, when I interview people, I try and find out if they are a verb or they're a sore. Now, a verb to me is someone who's a victim. They're entitled. You know, I've been in the job 10 years. I'm entitled to a pay rise. They need to be rescued. They never stop to think about the solutions. They just immediately go to people for the answers and they blame the world for their woes. You know, look at our politicians. That's, there are a lot of verbs in that space. Equally, the people who saw, right? So when I'm interviewing people, I ask questions to try and find out if they're solutions orientated, right? Because things go wrong. That's okay. What's the solution? They take ownership of what they do. So it's my fault. I wear it. You know, it's like when you play sport and you drop the ball, right? You've got to try 10 times harder to get the next ball. They're accountable for everything they do and they're responsible. So I look for people who try and fit that mold. And if they are solution-based and not verb-based, then you find they're already inclined to have that open mind to be able to go, right, okay, I appreciate the creative or I appreciate the analytical because they're always going, if there's a better way, I will find it. I really like the thought process of being solutions oriented, Janine. I mean, as you, as you rightfully said, I think in any line of work or any industry and even outside, whether it's building a property portfolio or not, particularly early into those stages where you're, you're feeling out a lot of what you're doing, even if you do have the right support behind you, things do go wrong. And it's really important that people can own that and obviously work on, okay, well, what's the solution? How do we resolve this? Instead of going back into their shell like a tortoise and sort of retreating from the world and, and blaming everyone else for their situation. I'd love to talk about your experiences on Shark Tank and Survivor. What was that like for the first time? Was it daunting? I mean, obviously you're very comfortable in the media eye, I would imagine, if it's safe to assume. But, you know, you, you spend a lot of time on telly. You're very passionate about entrepreneurship and business. Was there something that you took away from those experiences for the first time and, and, and later on? I think every experience you have, whether it's TV, non-TV, you'd have takeaways for everything. You know, whether you go to a seminar or a health retreat. You know, Shark Tank was fascinating because it really got me to be exposed to many industries that I'd never normally be involved with. You know, we came people coming up with all sorts of ideas and gadgets and gizmos. And so it was quite an eye-opener to see what other businesses and industries are out there. So that was fascinating. Survivor was a whole new level of self-discovery and because it really is primal. It did take you back to that primal person of where am I going to eat today? The physical attributes, you know, we didn't go and kill lions, but 
we certainly, the challenges were sort of, again, got the adrenaline going of that fight and flight sort of mentality. And then that relationship base and where the best of people and the worst of people came out. So, you know, Survivor, I was on the on the island for 44 days and, you know, the relationships I, I gathered were, you know, I, I still speak to one particular particular person sort of at least once a week, you know, and we're the thickest thieves. And, and immediately if I catch up with other people who I was on the island with, immediately you sit down and you, you instead of having that, oh, it's a nice weather, we immediately get into really juicy conversations because we've broken down all those barriers of niceties because we've seen each other in the most raw human state you possibly can get. So I think that in life, though, you should say yes more than no, because yes means that, you know, it's, it was very easy to say no to Survivor. You know, who would want to go in and be exposed like that emotionally, but equally have it at, at broadcast on national TV? And, you know, it is, um, it is, you are as raw as you possibly can get. But I'm a believer that this is a life that I want to live and I want to live as, as full as I can. So I will say yes before I say no. It does take a lot of courage and tenacity to put yourself out there and, you know, on a show like Survivor, particularly, you know, when you've already got a public profile. But I think that, you know, going through that sort of breakdown to that breakthrough and building those relationships with people on the show that you've shared a very unique experience with is is fantastic. And it's great that you can, you know, jump straight into real personal style conversation as opposed to pleasantries exchange, as you mentioned. If we can move to family life, Lloyd, I know that your family's been a real big driver behind everything you do. Janine, you you mentioned that your husband, Jeff, is the most influential person in your life. Where does family fit into the equation today and in the past in terms of amongst entrepreneurship, business and everything else? Uh, For me, you know, I had four children. Three of them were probably at the peak of growing business. This fourth one came a bit later. And, you know, I'm I'm a very different person with those two. Look, to be honest, it was just a blur. You know, I, I was 32 when I started Boost and I had a seven-month-old at the, at the time when I started the Boost. So it was crazy busy and it was literally just a blur. I didn't eat well. I didn't exercise enough. I didn't go out. I just basically worked and did a, um average job of raising my children. You know, I was the parent that people hung out with to feel good about their parenting, you know, because I was the mm-hmm. one that always was late for, for class. The kids were always in the wrong uniform, you know. I never knew what notices I had to sign. So it was, but you know what, that was, that was okay too. I was relatively kind with myself to just go, look, it is what it is. I'm just sort of surviving. And I think a lot of people who'd be listening to this, particularly with lockdown and having to deal with you know, homeschooling, you just do what you can do, right? And I think just be kind to yourself, right? You're not going to get it all right. <laughs> you know, the kids with too much TV, they'll survive. You know, So I think at the end of the day, though, you just do the best you can do. And I think that as long as the kids know that they are loved and supported, it'll all wash out in the end. It's very true. And Lloyd, how are you handling on that note? Lockdown, schooling, lockdown. Or well, you're you're on still a little one. Well, Riley, we're, so. we're still got little yeah. ones, like two and a half year old and a baby. Yeah. But I'm I'm very intrigued. I mean, it's quite amazing, Janine, that you've you set up a business. And you had a seven month old. I mean, we've got a three month old at, at the moment, and just to imagine that you're actually setting up a new business and, and having a baby is is quite an amazing feat. So I think that's that's incredible. Yeah, I managed to breastfeed and type at the same time. It was very convenient. <laughs> But no, look, my thoughts go out to people that are actually homeschooling and stuff at the moment because I think that would be very challenging working from home and, and homeschooling, Alex. I mean, we're fortunate that our, our son Riley goes to daycare. I dropped him off there on the way here this morning. And then Renee's just looking after our, our younger son who's three months old at the moment. So we're pretty fortunate from that. But yeah, like Janine said, you do what you've got to do and um, everything comes with its challenges. But yeah, we just keep plugging along. Keep chipping away. I'm intrigued. Lockdown, as, as we briefly touched on before, it's a, it's a good breeding ground, obviously, for new ideas and business. For people that might have kids at home that are homeschooling, is there a way that kids can get involved with new business or, you know, how do we captivate and grow the next generation of entrepreneurs? Is is it something you think starts at a young age? I think um, one thing that you can't do is you can't force a round hole into a square peg. Kids come out with their own little personalities and their own drives and their own, I've got four kids and one is a full on hippie that kills his own food. And I've got one, one kid that is the biggest entrepreneur that is just all about money and success. And then I've got a surfer dude. And then my daughter, she's 13, she's still working it out. You can't go, right, I'm going to prepare my children for business. And the kid goes, well, I just want to be an artist, right? Or yeah, so you've just got to, you just got to be there, keep your ears open, give them exposures to lots of different things and let them find their own path. I spoke to this guy years ago about how he he put his son into his business. It was a big media business. And he, I said, is your son the best person for the role? He said, not far from it. 
I said, is the son want to do the role? He goes, no, but it's his duty as my son to take on the mantle and continue. Now, this kid, this man was, you know, he was messed up, right? He was doing something he didn't want to do because he had to do it because his dad told him to. And he, as a small child, it was told to do that. When I think he probably just wanted to be a monk on a hill somewhere. So I think with kids having four is that at the end of the day, just let them breathe. And let them, you know, I think you if you've got a business and you're growing your business, great. They might want to get involved, they may not, right? But don't force them. No, it's great advice. And, you know, I think it's really important that we do help people develop their passion. I'm sure if one of your children, you know, loved art, they were creative and that's the space they want to go to, you know, you would do everything I would imagine humanly possible to help cultivate that interest in the field, wouldn't you? Alex, I was just going to say, like, that's actually a really good example of what Janine was saying because my dad was a business owner. Yet I studied music at the conservatorium to start with, and I just followed the passion. And my parents completely just, you know, fostered that passion and they basically just encouraged me the whole time. And then later on, I turned into business, but that was off my own volition, had nothing to do with the fact that my dad was a business owner. So it's it's just about how my life has turned out. But there was no talk about me going into the family business in Orange or anything at the time. So what Janine's saying, I think is really good advice. Absolutely. And Janine, fast forwarding to today, what do you have in store for the next year besides finding a property on the Northern Beaches, which we briefly touched on. Yeah, other than that, look, you know, we've made the move from Victoria to New South Wales. So it's really establishing, making sure my daughter's established well into the community. And yeah, as you said, finding our roots. You know, I think that everyone likes to, you know, feel like that they have a solid foundation to be able to springboard from. And so, yes, at the moment we're sort of renting, we're looking for the right property. It'll come when it's, when it's meant to come. And yes, so it's just really, that's probably what our focus is at the moment. And then obviously all the businesses that we sort of get dabble into, making sure they're as successful as we can. It must be quite surreal, you know, moving from Victoria to the beaches and, you know, if you go down to your local mall, see your boosters shop and how does that feel, you know, getting to this stage of your life and career almost forms part of your ongoing legacy really, doesn't it? Yeah, look, you know, so we've got, what, 600 stores in 12 countries. So we're sort of, you have gone through that thing of, wow, there's a boost store. And, you know, it's more when you go overseas and you see them walking around with your, you know, the logo that you created and the colours that you created for it. It makes you go, wow, okay, this is quite extraordinary. But I think that equally, like children, you know, your business grows up to a point where you need other people to look after it, you know, and you need to be able to grow a business with the skills and confidence to be able to run without you. And that's really what you need to be doing for children and for businesses is make sure you've got systems and processes that are effective enough for you to go on holidays, right? Some people go, I've never been on holidays five years because the business will fall apart. Well, you need to rethink about that. You need to put in structure to ensure that, or, or people to be able to, and to be honest, maybe if you go away, maybe they'll do well, you know, hey, give them a go. It's very true. I mean, how many times, Lloyd, probably like myself, you know, you speak to someone and, you know, they're, they're so busy in the business and they can't leave or otherwise the doors will close. But I think, you know, it's so important we've learned over the years to put everything in your diary as an appointment. If it's going for a run in the morning, you know, make that time to do things that are important to you and also to cultivate that family life, which we just touched on. Well, very important, Alex. And, and that's one of the things I always try to do is, you know, take my dog for a run in the morning. I think my dog gives me a bit more of a motivation to run. But like Janine said, I still have those mornings where oh, do I really want to get up and <laughs> should I just like lay in for a little bit longer and things like that. But like we've talked about before, it's so important to work on your business and not in your business because, you know, you need to have those systems in place because, you know, I met a lot of people who said they haven't been able to you know, take a day of work for five years because, you know, they're just busy working in their business, but they, they need to have those systems in place because eventually you have burnout. And the problem is you'll have burnout and a business that can't function by itself. So you need to put in those managers and, and people that can actually do things like that. And when it comes back to, you know, to family life, I mean, obviously growing a business and running a business is hard work. And it's not, you know, some people, probably some of the, the social media stuff out there, they sort of promote, oh, you know, if you start your own business, you can you know, just live the life you want. But it's not quite like that. You know, there's a lot of work that goes into to growing a business. But once you get it to a certain point, the whole idea is you should be able to spend more time with your family. You, know, you should be able to go on those holidays. Or I know with me, at least, you know, when my wife was pregnant, you know, we can, I can go to all her doctor's appointments and things like that and spend time with the kids, you know, during the week and stuff like that, which I think is really important because that's, that's what life's about. It is about family and it's about setting your lifestyle up so you can do things like that. Absolutely. Janine, speaking strictly around the property space, at the moment, you're very much engaged with the property market. In your past experiences, I mean, Lloyd, being an advocate in property, a buyer's agent, an investment specialist, have you been awfully involved in property investing yourself? Is it something you're passionate about? Have you found that some of your business skills have been interchangeable into property or by contrast, has 
investing in property taught you anything about business? I think anything you're doing with a deal of any capacity is someone wants to sell and someone wants to buy, you know, it gets as simple as that. And that's, you know, whether they're selling a business or whether they're selling a property or they're selling a boat or selling a car, you know, they're all same, same. Property is, uh, I've always been in property. There's always been a house. I'm renovating a house in Noosa at the moment. I've always got multiple properties on the run at, at, at any one time. So it's something that I enjoy. And yeah, I think that there's some, particularly in the Australian market, many other countries, you probably wouldn't have an investment purely in property. And, and I don't think anyone should have just in property, but I think Australia market is, is such a buoyant market in that area. Equally, market goes down too. So, you know, just because at the moment it's as hot as hot as a bit hot potato, but equally that's because we're in a really unusual environment and there's, there is a lot of people moving and changing, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be like this forever. I mean, I remember God, when I was probably a teenager, that there was 17% interest rate rises and the prices were going crazy. That didn't last. And life is a pendulum. If it's going too far one way, it will definitely go through the other way at some point. So I think that you don't be bullish. Don't be too bullish in the sense that don't buy it at any price. And I think that just really understand the market. But equally, your home is often an emotional purchase, not a business purchase. And if it is your home, then yeah, maybe you do have to push yourself a bit harder. And if it's an investment business, then that's really easy. What do the numbers say? What is the return? What is the money going in? So it depends on your purchase in property of really how you think about it. Absolutely. And and I guess everything, if we want to summarize it in a nutshell, it's strategy, isn't it, Lloyd? It, it's having the right strategy over a short term, longer term. That ultimately will, will steer you in the right direction in terms of what you're trying to achieve. Well, absolutely, Alex. Uh, it is about your goals, what you're trying to achieve. And as Janine says, you know, if, it, if it's your own home purchase, then it's, it's emotional and that's something a little bit different. If it's an investment, then you know, what, what are you looking to achieve? I think long-term wise. So rather than just looking at the numbers on that individual property, it's about what are you trying to achieve long-term? Is, is this about leaving a legacy for your kids? Are you looking to try to supplement your income through some um, cash flow from properties in the future? Are you looking to be able to fund your kids in private schools in the future by maybe selling down some properties and funding that? So everyone's got their own goals. And that's what's really important. But at the end of the day, the fundamentals remain the same. So as an investment, you know, buying in the right location and making sure you're not overpaying. So, you know, like Janine says, what do the numbers say? Equally, you've got to remember, though, that some people's strategy is to buy their own property and flip it. And that is also because that, let's not kid ourselves, it's the best tax free money you're ever going to get. So, you know, I think just understanding the fundamentals of property and business in the sense that if you have an investment property, you can claim the interest on that. On your home loan, you can't. So make sure that if you are have got multiple properties, that the interest is or the loan is on the investment property, not on your home loan, because you can't claim it. So just understanding how the tax component works will actually assist you in your decision making as well. Absolutely. And and once again, it just comes back to that dream team, doesn't it, Lloyd? Having the people that you can go to to give you guidance around things in that yeah, space. That's right, Alex. So yeah, obviously having the the advice from the accountants, you know, financial advisor, uh, solicitors, things like that. And that comes down to strategy, what Janine's saying. So, you know, obviously having the loan on your investment properties. And as we've spoken about before, you know, paying down that home. So, you know, putting all your money into the offset account of your home loan, paying down that, that all comes down to strategy. If you've got extra funds, put it there. If you're selling the investment property, maybe use those funds to pay down your own home. Again, depending on what you're trying to achieve and the strategy there. And in terms of your property journey, we like to look back at, you know, some of the things that we could have done better or, you know, should have done this, should have done that. Hindsight's such a great thing. Have there been times on, from a property perspective that you've sort of looked back and go, okay, well, maybe that property there in Noosa wasn't the best idea or maybe this or, or that, or, or are you quite content with everything you've done? In no, this space? you know, you, I'm always content with what you, you've got. I mean, you can always do bigger, better you know, maybe I shouldn't have sold that. Maybe I should have bought that quicker. Yeah. But I think at the end of the day, you make the decisions based on the information you have at the time. So right now we are in a situation where we have lockdowns and we have 41% of people on LinkedIn who wants to change their jobs. We've got people who go, I no longer want to live near the city. So there's a, a massive urban spread happening. So there is some permanent things that are changing, which actually does affect property prices in, in positive and negative. As I said, it, it's a scale. What get taken over here will actually go over there. So you have to understand that as well. But equally, the decisions I've made each time on the properties is with the information I had at the time. So, you know, when I bought a Noosa, you know, I bought, I thought at a time where it was a good time and then it got flat for eight years. Well, the information at the time was that Noosa went up 30% year on year, blah, blah, blah. So I based my information on that. So you, you can only do what you can do, but also history tells you future. 
you know, what goes up must come down. When it comes down and how high it goes up, we don't really know. But there is going to be a point where there is a leveling of some point. So, you know, if it's a family home and it's an emotional then maybe you make a better, different decision than you go, okay, I'm an investor. Do I wait? Do I get in now? Like it, it is a hard one to pick other than all you can do is look at the past. It's very true. And we were just saying off air, predicting short-term markets is, it's very much a crystal ball question. There's so many social and economic drivers behind, you know, what dictates a market. And, you know, every market in Australia, every suburb is its own market. So it's not a one size fits all approach. Lloyd, I guess a lot of that does come down to strategy once again. In your experience, when you are you know, working with clients, how important is it to really knuckle down on what they're exactly trying to achieve and, and also helping uncover what the client might want to do? Because sometimes it's not always present and top of mind for them, is it? You've got to sort of dig a bit deeper to work out the best path forward. That's right, Alex. A lot of the time, because I, I always dig deeper to see where, what they want to achieve over the next 10, 15 years. And I always relate that back to sort of what, what I've done and sort of talk about my journey and things. A lot of the time people might know my journey because they've read Positively Geared. But yeah, look, it really is about what their, their long-term goals are. And then a lot of the time they don't necessarily understand themselves what they're trying to achieve. So, you know, we can t- sort of discuss that. And sometimes people say, oh, I just want to have a property portfolio, but you can't just have a property portfolio for the sake of it. It must serve its purpose. So are you looking for some passive income? Are you looking to leave a legacy for your kids. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of reasons there. But equally, uh, when it comes down to the strategy within the markets, like you said, no one's got a crystal ball. Take last year, for example, lockdowns. You know, as soon as uh, the pandemic hit, the markets all stopped. Yeah, phones stopped ringing. Nobody wanted to do any property transactions or anything because people didn't know what was going to happen. You know, all these economists were coming out and predicting 40% falls in the market and stuff like that. That didn't happen. And then this year, things have gone crazy. Much more growth than you know, even I expected. And then with the current lockdown, that hasn't really impacted prices at all because people are now comfortable and they know the markets are resilient. So people are still just buying sight unseen. I mean, Brisbane's an example where people are just from the southern states are buying up in Brisbane, not even getting building and pest inspections done. They just there's just a lot of FOMO. People are just buying, you know, obviously without strategy, they're just they're just buying because they don't want to miss out and things like that. But again, with lockdowns and, and the lack of stock, you still can't really predict what's going to happen because once these vaccine targets are hit and we start to come out of lockdown, there may be more stock listed because I know of vendors that have taken their properties off the markets during lockdown because they didn't want people walking through their, their homes or they thought they'd get a better a sales result after lockdown. So if they start listing towards sort of November, December into next year, that could affect the prices. That could could put downwards pressure on the prices. Depends how many buyers are still in the market. So uh, the prices could still keep increasing, but no one's got a crystal ball to see what really will happen at that stage either. You're very right. And I mean, there's so many moving parts to how markets work, you know, the property dynamic, you know, we talk about high supply, low demand dynamics and vice versa. You know, they're ultimately going to determine each geographical marketplace you're trying to invest in. Janine, it's been really great having you here in the studio today. Thank you very much for your time. Just in closing, some words of wisdom that we can leave with all our listeners today. If Janine Alice could say something to Janine Alice 30 years ago or 20 years ago, what do you think that advice would be? If I saw myself 30 years ago sitting on a park bench, I would sit next to me, put my hand on her back, I'd pat it, say, good luck, honey. Because the reality is that in your journey of life, you will make the wrong decisions and you'll make the right decisions. But it's actually as much about the decisions that you've made wrong that has made you who you are today than the one you've done right. So if I said, look, here is a list of the dates and times that you get it all wrong and I avoided them, then I wouldn't have learned the lessons and I wouldn't be where I am today. So in actual fact, you have to go through your own journey. So I wouldn't give her any advice other than go for it. And I guess in closing, with that in mind, how important is legacy to you and what does leaving a legacy mean to you? It doesn't mean anything to me. Like it, I don't, if I'm dead, I'm dead. You know, I can't go, I want to leave a legacy. I want to live a good life. I want to do the right thing by people. I want to have my kids happy. If that leads into some sort of legacy, well, that's fine. That's other people's to decide. That's what a legacy is. It's other people's, what they think of you. So I don't really care what people think of me. But if I do all the things that I want in life, maybe that might result in a legacy. On behalf of Lloyd and, and myself, Janine, we've really enjoyed your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure. I'm sure you agree, Lloyd. No, thanks so much, Janine. Really appreciate it. Lo- loved having the chat. Pleasure. This podcast episode was produced by ASCII Live Media.